For the past week, AM 1150's Brittany Webster has presented a series of stories about the realities of life at the former Kamloops Indian Residential School. Today, we present that series in its entirety in honour of the National Day for Truth and Reconciliation. With survivor testimony, thanks to the National Centre for Truth and Reconciliation, AM 1150 presents A Living Nightmare, Kamloops Indian Residential School. Go back to your seven-year-old self. A cattle truck pulls up in front of your house and you are dragged, likely kicking and screaming, not knowing when or if you'll ever see your family again. You are punished for speaking the only language you know, and life as you once knew it was gone forever. That was a reality for First Nations children attending Kamloops Indian Residential School, a reality for Indigenous children across Canada. By 1920, Duncan Campbell Scott, Deputy Superintendent for the Department of Indian Affairs at the time, wanted to get rid of what he called the Indian problem and played a pivotal role in expanding the residential school system by making it mandatory for all Indigenous children aged seven or older to attend a residential school. Hector McDonald is a former student. I believe I almost hated my dad and mom for sending me to, to school here, you know. But I always think they were going to get sent to jail if they didn't send me to school, you know. Once children arrived at the school, they were separated further from their family, unable to mingle with their siblings. When my sister would walk around the block here, I'd wave at them, and wave at her, and I'd get a strap for it, you know. Children were taken from their families, and upon arriving at the school, they were punished for not speaking a language they had never been taught. Jeanette Jules attended KIRS in the 60s. Our grandparents spoke some weapons gene to us, but uh, most of us could understand it. But the speaking of it daily was not allowed here. My dad's words to the priest was, it does something to you when you're, when you're five, six years old and somebody continuously beats you up every day, all day long, when you can't speak English. That does something to a little kid. But as stated by Scott, the objective of residential schools was, quote, to continue until there is not a single Indian in Canada, end quote. And abolishing Indigenous languages was seen as a way of achieving that. Girls were also forced to cut their hair short, and children had to dress in European-style clothing. Any sense of identity was stripped from the children the moment they stepped on that cattle truck. And the brainwashing of generations had parents sending their runaway children back to the people who believed it was their job to uphold the supposed mission of residential schools, to kill the Indian in the child. Christina Rose, Casimir, lived that reality. I went from grade one to ten, and then I ran away from school because I couldn't take it anymore. I just couldn't handle it. My mom had died January 3rd, 1959. Like I said, I have a heart attack. And like I said, my dad really believed in education, so he made me go back. Mental, emotional, sexual, physical abuse came in all forms for the children. And no matter how hard they worked or how well they did, there was little reward. Many generations of Indigenous families were forced into the residential school system, subject to years of hate and abuse. Jeanette Jules attended Kamloops Indian Residential School in the 60s. She recalls the evening routine of one security guard. Security guy wanted to come into the senior girls' dorm with this flashlight need be flashing it on the girls' faces. And you'd start hearing girls whimpering and covering up their faces because who was he going to choose? Who was he going to decide that he was going to go and take? It wasn't just the girls subject to sexual abuse from school staff. Don Seymour has since passed away but recorded his testimony. He attended KIRS as a day scholar in the 70s. Me and my friend is also a day scholar. That was when uh, we were sexually abused by a priest and uh, the two supervisors, and they're all men. Seymour says they'd be pulled away during lunch several times a week. That supervisor would abuse me and he had abused my best friend while I had to pray for my sins, as I was told. I was going to go to hell and blah, blah, blah. And uh, 
while I was trained, he had sexually abused my friend. Some staff knew the children were being abused and did try to do something about it. But as Jules explains, pushback wasn't welcome. One of the new supervisors that we had that year, was, her name was Mrs. Leslie. Mrs. Leslie, they tried to fire her because she brought that up to the priest and told them, why are you allowing the, this, these guys to come in and go and uh, take these young girls? Christina Rose Casimir ran away after finding the school too much to endure, but her father sent her back. From the Indian school, they taught us that we're bad, no good. But who was going to tell them they were bad and they were no good to us? And that they were awful to us. We were lonely little children who didn't have their parents. Attending a residential school was nothing short of a living nightmare for many children. And Kamloops Indian Residential School was one of Canada's largest, enrolling around 500 children by the 50s. The former Kamloops Indian Residential School would have included Indigenous children from across the Thompson Okanagan region. Living conditions for children attending Kamloops Indian Residential School were Over the past week, AM 1150's Brittany Webster has presented a series of stories about the realities of life at the former Kamloops Indian Residential School. In honor of the National Day for Truth and Reconciliation, AM 1150 is presenting the series in its entirety. We have heard the horrors children who attended the school faced, mental, emotional, sexual, and physical abuse. But those with the power to change things were only interested in abolishing the Indigenous way of life. The education that was supposed to improve the future for Indigenous children was manipulative, damaging, and for many, fatal. The residential school system was originally meant to bridge the education gap between white children and Indigenous children. But the actual school learning was minimal on a daily basis. Mary Birchall is a Kamloops Indian residential school survivor. We didn't go to school there. We spent two bloody hours learning about the catechism. Much of the days were spent working, cleaning, and learning the Catholic faith, 
while things like reading, writing, and arithmetic were pushed to the background. Hector McDonald began attending KIRS at age 11. I learned a lot in school here, a lot, but never learned how to read. Or, oh, I knew how to read, but I don't know how to write. I learned how to cheat, steal, hate. Despite the lack of proper teaching, survivor Jeanette Jules took with her some advice from her grandmother, who attended the school in the early 1900s. And in order for us to truly fight back and to do things in the way that we need to, we need to be able to read and write what they're, what they're giving us and so that they can't tell us one thing and then write something down. Some survivors were able to find escapes through the things that they were able to learn and do. David Archie attended Kamloops Indian Residential School in the 1940s. Having never seen electricity before, at nine years old, it looked like magic. 14 years old, I was given the custodian uh, job of changing light bulbs. I was right in my element. Day school survivor Dolly Thomas found her escape in dance. We used to have dances. That was the best thing. You know, I thought that was really cool because I was a really good dancer. I still am, you know. <laughs> I am still cut the rug. <laughs> On rare occasions, students were even able to make a name for themselves, like Roger Adolph. Adolph turned fighting into boxing at Kamloops Indian Residential School. He later won the Golden Gloves in 1964, 65, and 66 in Tacoma, Portland, and Seattle before turning pro. Upon his retirement from boxing a few years later, Adolph served as chief and a strong leader in his community of Statham Nation. It was rare for a student to find light in the darkness, and for some, that darkness never ended. Some survivors remember digging graves for children who died at the school. Today, Canada is taking steps toward reconciliation, but there is a long way to go. There is enough evidence to prove that life at Kamloops Indian Residential School was degrading and horrific. More than four decades after the school officially closed, the bodies of 215 children as young as three years old, have been discovered, buried in unmarked graves, and hardly spoken of. And thousands more bodies are being discovered at former residential school sites across Canada. Horrific life residential school survivors faced has rightfully left some with a great deal of hate. Survivor David Archie had this to say at the 2013 hearing in Kamloops. I have a bone to pick with the British. I make sure that it was the British people that were at the end of my fists or my work boots or when I smashed their heads on the sidewalk and knocked them out and I'd almost killed them, there would be blood coming out of their face. I was really angry. This rage came from the residential school. Archie says he has since learned to forgive, but the memories never go away. So how do we move forward in a better direction? Charlene Bearhead, Director of Reconciliation at Canadian Geographic and former National Coordinator for Project of Heart, says education is key to doing better in the future. The reality is then we have thousands and thousands and thousands of Canadians. I think the stats the other day were that two-thirds of Canadians still don't know about residential schools, which is shocking and unbelievable, or didn't know up until the time of Kamloops, even after six years of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. Bearhead says we owe it to Indigenous children and all children to teach the truth. Every one of them will be a leader in some way in, in any of those aspects of their lives. And we owe it to them to tell them the truth so that they can make the decisions that are best based on all the facts, not on the false reality that we are trying to brainwash them to believe so that they can perpetuate it to cover up things like the things that we're hearing right now. As the stories fall off the front pages and the number of unmarked graves found at former residential school sites grow, how can we make a difference? Yilmi Holm, or Chief, Christopher Derrickson of West Bank First Nation, says it takes more than just conversation. If you're wondering just on a personal level what you can do to support Indigenous peoples at this time, I think just moving past uh, social media activism is a first step because a post to your socials is well, thoughtful and I'm sure heartfelt. I think it's more about taking real action in your personal life to learn about the Indigenous peoples. And if you're 
if you have contact with Indigenous peoples, just start to acknowledge and not hide or run from the difficult conversations that we need to have as a country. Today marks the first National Day for Truth and Reconciliation in Canada. The day honours the lost children and survivors of residential schools, their families and communities. Today is also Orange Shirt Day. It relates the experience of Phyllis Webstead. On her first day at residential school, she arrived dressed in a new orange shirt, which was taken from her. It's now a symbol of the stripping away of culture, freedom, and self-esteem experienced by Indigenous children over generations. We can't change the past, but we can learn from it. Today, all Canadians are encouraged to wear orange to raise awareness of the tragic legacy of residential schools, to honour those who survived and those who never made it home.